Good evening. It is so great to see everyone out tonight. I tell you, it has been a blessing to have Brother Fife and his family with us this week. We want to say thank you to all of our visitors. It is our pleasure to have you with us. It's good to see you all out tonight and so glad that you're here. And if you're visiting tonight, we want to thank you for coming out to support the gospel meeting here at Highway 69. And uh, It's been a great week thus far and certainly I'm so glad to to be here this week and the blessing it is and uh, grateful for, again for this congregation for what they do for the Bible Talk program and, and so grateful for that support that you put into that. Did you hear about the two antennas that got married? The wedding wasn't that great but the reception was wonderful. <laughs> I just had to say that. I know that was corny but my wife gets on to me all the time for those corny jokes. So, Okay, I got one more. Do you know what a golf club's favorite type of music is? Swing. All right, I'm done. I promise, I'm done. When you look throughout the Bible, one of the things you understand is you look at the many different individuals within the pages of the Bible of the different personalities. And you can learn a lot from those different personalities and from the different groups of people that God records for us throughout the pages of the Holy Writ. And as you examine these characters, you begin to see the picture unfold that describes different traits of all these individuals. And as we look at them, we can learn a lot from them. But as we also look at them and as we study them, we can also ask ourselves if we're like those individuals. And certainly as we look at the different individuals throughout the pages of the Bible, there are some people that we really don't want to be like because those traits certainly don't reflect a godly individual or a righteous person that God wants us to be. And as we study these different characters, certainly there are many that are profitable to us, whether they're for the good or whether they're for the bad. And one of the things that we can look at when we look at the different traits of individuals is that they can give us insight into our own lives to help us be better Christians. But when you think about these characters within the pages of the Bible, how do you stack up to them? How do you measure up to them? But better yet, let me ask you this question. What did God get when He got you? What type of person are you when it comes to serving God? What type of individual are you that makes up your character that reflects the type of person that God wants you to be or better yet, what God doesn't want you to be? So I'm going to ask you tonight as we go through different individuals tonight, as we look at the different characters, I want you to ask yourselves if you're like any of these individuals. And some I hope that you are and certainly some I hope that you're not. So tonight again, let me ask the question. What did God get when He got you? Did He get a balanced Berean? We think about Acts 17 and verse 11 where it says, These were more noble than those than Thessalonica, and that they received the Word with all readiness of mind, and they searched the Scriptures daily whether those things were so. The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy 2.15 to study thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And when we think about the Bereans as we look at Acts chapter 23, as Paul is expounding unto these individuals as he's already spoke to the elders, as he's told them the things they need to do, Paul said there's a group of individuals, the balanced Bereans, that were willing to search out the things in which Paul was teaching. That's what they wanted to know. They wanted to understand these individual things because they wanted to be better children of God. You see, at last there was a Jewish community that was ready to receive the word with all readiness of mind. Paul had been on numerous, or through numerous towns and cities throughout his missionary journeys, three in particular up to this point, where he came across individuals that questioned everything that he taught. In Acts chapter 17, when he was on Mars Hill speaking to these individuals, they, they wanted to hear philosophies of men, nothing of which he was wanting to speak of. As a matter of fact, he says, You've got so many gods, you've even got one made to the unknown God just to make sure you got everything covered. But Paul said these individuals were balanced in their approach to God's Word. We have to ask ourselves the same question. You see, in such an age today, are we as noble as the Bereans during that time? Are we willing and ready to search out the Word to understand what it says and what it tells us that we need to do? The problem is, is I've studied the Bible with individuals who you can show them the truth and they still say it's not so. I had a man that I knocked on a door. We were door knocking in Commerce, Georgia. And as we knocked on the door... The individual told us to come in, and when we walked in, that old man didn't have any clothes on. And I said, sir, could you please put some clothes on? So he pulled the blanket over himself, and he said, sit down, I'd like to study the Bible with you. I said, okay. 
We'll take the opportunity then. And we began to study the Bible. And then finally he said, now tell me again what church you're with. And I said, well, we're with the Commerce Church of Christ. He goes, oh, you're one of those folks who thinks baptism is necessary for salvation. He said, you know, the Bible doesn't tell us that we have to be baptized to be saved. I said, can I show you a verse? And I said, I simply want you to say yes or no to the verse. So I turned to 1 Peter 3.21 in my Bible where it says, The like figure unto where baptism doth also now save us. I said, yes or no, does it say there that, the, that baptism saves us? He said, get out of my house and get off my porch. He didn't want to see the truth for what it was. He wasn't willing to have an open mind and study it like the Bereans were. He wasn't balanced in his Bible study approach because he had a closed mind. We do the Fishers of Men Bible study. And as a matter of fact, we're teaching the course right now at faith. And one of the first things that it asks in the very first study that you sit down to conduct with someone is this question. Are you a truthful and honest person and do you have an open mind that's willing to learn? You see, because if you're not honest and your mind is not open, you can't learn anything. It doesn't matter what I show you in the Bible. Even even Jesus told the individuals to dust off their feet and move on for those that didn't want to learn. It's not that we don't care for souls because we're supposed to care for souls. But when we teach them, if they're not going to be receptive to the Word, ladies and gentlemen, there are a lot more people in the world that want to hear the truth of the Gospel. Amen. And we've got to be balanced in our approach when we do that. So ask yourself tonight, did God get a balanced Berean when He got you? I certainly pray that's the case. But let me ask you this, when God got you, did He get a contentious Corinthian? Somebody who wants to cause division? Somebody who likes to stir up strife within the Lord's church? Listen to what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 10-13. through He says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me, Paul says, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions or divisions or problems that are taking place among you. Now this I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Divisiveness was a part of the Corinthian problem. Not only were they having trouble in the way that they were worshiping, they couldn't get along either. That's right. Because individuals wanted to point it at men who were saving them and following men who they thought would save them rather than following Christ who was the only one that could save them. You see, they were divided over personalities, over different things that they thought men were teaching different. But here's the thing. Cephas and Apollos and Paul weren't teaching anything different. They were teaching all of the same things. The problem is they weren't following the Word, they were following the man. They wanted to go after what these men were saying. You see, the problem was they had what we like to call preacheritis. It wasn't about the message, it was about the preacher. And that's a problem sometimes in today in the Lord's church. I've seen preachers divide churches, unfortunately, and half the congregation will leave and go with that man. That man's not God, he's not Christ, and as Paul said, he wasn't crucified for you. Did he die on the cross for you? You see, we don't follow what men say. Remember what Jesus said, For in vain they do worship Me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. You see, as God's children, as Jesus said, we have to let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify who? Larry Fife? No. Glorify Travis Byers? No. To glorify our Father, which is in heaven. It's about Jesus Christ, not about the preacher. Paul said you're... You're stirring up contentions among yourself and you're being divisive over silly things that don't matter. Follow the Word and the message and Jesus Christ and don't listen or follow the messenger, so to speak. You see, because the problem was these things were dividing the church in half. And here's Paul having to basically slap them on the hand and say, y'all better better act right. Because it's causing nothing but trouble. Paul said, I'm hearing this all the way over in Ephesus that I'm having to write to you because of the contentions and the divisions that's taking place within your congregation. Now we know certainly that doesn't happen today, right? Now we don't ever hear about contentions and division and problems, do we? Murmurings and complainings. Now that wouldn't happen to the Lord's church in the 21st century. Certainly not. Unfortunately, it does happen. And the problem is is that it's men who want to have their way rather than doing what God says. Unfortunately, we have some diatrophies in the Lord's church as we read in in 3 John that like to have the preeminence that cause division and cause strife and problems. When I was a green preacher, when I was a baby preacher, I like to call myself, the very first congregation that I worked for, 
And one thing I learned, never preach where you have family. Well. And then your wife's family at that. <laughs> but do you know that church split over flowers and lights in the auditorium? You see, because some ladies didn't get to pick out the light fixtures because some other ladies went and didn't invite them. Some other ladies picked out the flowers that they were putting around the church sign in the front of the building. The other ladies didn't get to pick it out. So they went to their husbands because we didn't have elders and they complained to the men. And the men came and complained to me said it was my fault. I said, I don't have anything to do with the money, light fixtures, nor flowers. I'm just here to preach. That's right. The problem was they were caught up over petty things, things that didn't matter. They were causing contention within the body of Christ. And it caused a problem within the congregation. Amen. You see, when we stick to God's Word and His message of what He tells us to do, we don't have to worry about contentions. When we see that it's not about us, when the man who stands in the pulpit knows that he's standing beneath the cross and behind it and not in front of it, and he's preaching for it rather than for himself, then we understand Amen. there aren't going to be any contentions in the Lord's church. Amen. Remember, we were saved to serve other individuals, not serve ourselves. As it says that we crucify ourselves daily, as Paul talks about. So, tonight, what kind of individual are you? What did God get when He got you? Did He get a balanced Berean? Did He get a contentious Corinthian? Or really what I hope is that He got a focused Philippian. Notice Philippians 1, verses 3-5 through 5 with me. Paul writes, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine for, all, for you all making requests with joy for your fellowship in the Gospel from the first day until now. Paul had nothing but praise for the Philippians. Philippians 4 and verse 4, Paul said, Rejoice in the Lord always again, I will rejoice. Paul understood because of the faithfulness of the Philippian brethren and their encouragement and joy to him always, as we often refer to the book of Philippians as the book of joy or the book of happiness, as they're encouraging Paul about that. He said, I can always look to you and you're always in my prayers because you are always there to support me and you are always faithful to God. He said, I have nothing but good words and praise for the wonderful congregation in which you are. You see, Paul had a fervent zeal for them. And as a member of the Lord's church, do you have that Philippian disposition? That is, are you faithful in your service? Are you happy? You see, these brethren were happy to be Christians. The problem today is we got some members in the Lord's church as they listen to the gospel and sing the song, look like they've been weaned on dill pickles. They don't look happy. We got everything to be happy about, don't we? We got everything to rejoice over. Philippians 4 and 4 again says, Rejoice in the Lord always again. I will say rejoice. And we've got every reason to rejoice because we have the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. Why would you not be happy about that? But yet we walk around and, Are you a Christian? Yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah, and what? Are people going to be happy about that? Do they want to come to church with us if we're not happy about who saved us and who died for us and what He did for us? No, absolutely not. That's right. You see, we need to be those faithful Philippians who are focused on God's Word and doing His work. Notice what Paul says in Philippians 2.12. He says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only. Paul said, you didn't only do it when I was here. Paul said, but how much more in my absence that you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Paul said, you didn't serve me, you served God. And it wasn't about me when I was there, you were serving God. And even when I wasn't there, you were serving God and you were happy about it. Man. Paul said that's the type of focused, faithful service that it means to be one of the Philippians who is ready to serve God with joy always in their heart. You see, that's what God got when He got those individuals. He didn't get a contentious Corinthian. He got the balanced Bereans and the faithful Philippians, those who were ready to serve. But you see, here's the thing we need to ask ourselves. We too have to walk by the simple mind to mind the same thing and to have the mind which Christ had. Philippians 2 and verse 5. Ask yourself the question, how am I remembered as a child of God? How am I going to be remembered as a child of God? Certainly, I'm sure many of you have been to a faithful Christian's funeral and you hear the preacher get up or, or a family member or a member of the congregation get up and talk about the joy they had in Christ and what a faithful Christian they were and how they served God faithfully and the work and the zeal they put into it, how are you going to be remembered? Are you going to be remembered as the individual? Well, he came to church. He was here every now and then. I mean, if you really needed something, you had to really prod him, but he would help you eventually. 
Are you the, the individual that was faithful in their service who was happy there when the doors were open, not only to worship God, but there when they were open to work at the building? When they were there to serve also in service to God and helping things get done around the Lord's church. You see, can I say that I'm reliable? Am I resilient in my service to God? And am I resourceful in those things in which I do? Do you know how successful the Lord's church would be today if we had folks who would use the talent that God gave them? There are so many people I see in the body of Christ that have so much talent and so many things they can offer to the Lord's church that don't use it. And what bothers me as a gospel preacher is when I have to beg people to want to do the Lord's work. Amen. When I have to beg somebody to do the Lord's work, sometimes I think they forget the view of the cross and how they need to be seen. Because they're not doing those things because the preacher asked them. They're not doing those things because the elders asked them. They're doing those things because Jesus Christ died on the cross for them. It's not about doing it for the elders or for the preacher or for anybody else. You're doing it for Christ. Of anything, remember that. You know, I try and tell the ladies in our congregation all the time that do so many wonderful things behind the scenes that nobody ever notices. From the billboards to everything that gets done in our church building to the things of preparing the Lord's Supper, all the many wonderful works they do that go unnoticed. And you know what? 99% of the time I thank them, they say, I don't, you don't need to thank me. I'm just happy to do it. Amen. That's the type of attitude that we have to have. Amen. That's the person that God needs to get in us. Not a contentious Corinthian, but a balanced Berean and a faithful Philippian. Remember what Paul said, I can do all things through Christ which strengthened me, Philippians 4.13? Paul understood what it meant to be like the Philippians. He was thankful for those brethren because they encouraged him. There's nothing more wonderful than to walk into a congregation like at Highway 69 that shakes your hand and they're happy to see you. Brother, I'm so glad you're here. I'm glad you're here to worship with us. Come in, sit down. Like you said last night, if you ain't got a congregation, come worship with us. We'll be happy to have you. That's a faithful Philippian attitude. But brother, I've been in some congregations, I felt like I walked in a morgue into a funeral. It was absolutely cold. Not one person said a thing to me. Not even the preacher walked up and said anything to me. That's sad. Because what happens if a visitor walks in and that's the type of type of uh, invitation that they get when they walk in the doors. Is this going to be where they want to worship? It's probably not. You see, they want to know that they're welcome, that they're loved. You see, this is the type of attitude that the Philippians had for Paul, and this is why he remembered them. He said, always in my prayers there's a remembrance of you. I'm thankful for everything that you did for me. You see, we need to ask ourselves, are we a house full of help like they were at Philippi? Are we ready with our zeal to serve God always? So, what did God get when He got you? Did He get a focused Philippian? Or did He get a gullible Galatian? Listen to Galatians 1, verses 6-9. through 9. I marvel that you are so soon removed from Him that called you unto the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And as we said before, so I say now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you other than that you have received, let him be accursed. Paul was amazed at how soon these Galatians were removed from what he came and taught them previously. He could not believe how quickly they had already turned away from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he expressed that amazement in how they exchanged the truth for a lie. How can you believe that when you've already had the truth? You know, sometimes it happens today. And obviously it was expressed plainly in the two words. He says, I marvel that you are so soon removed unto another. Something that can't save you. Something that will do nothing for you. And certainly something that Christ didn't teach Himself. Paul said, I can't believe you did this. You see, regardless of who proclaims it, regardless of what group teaches it, and regardless of how many folks are involved in it, if it's not the truth, then it's not the truth. And we have that happen today. But you know what? Sometimes we have to take that blame on ourselves, brother, and let me tell you where it happens. We have a person that walks into the Lord's church that begins to worship with us from time to time, and they begin to come more regularly. And perhaps they study with the preacher some or another member, an elder in the Lord's church, and they learn the truth of the Gospel. 
And they say, you know what, finally, here's the Sunday or the day they call the preacher and say, I'm ready to be baptized in the body of Christ. I know what I need to do to be saved. So they receive that precious invitation for Jesus Christ to have their sins washed away in that watery grave of baptism. They begin to serve with that zeal as they come out of that watery grave. They're ready to serve the Lord and do what they need to do. And then what do we do? We throw them into the pack of wolves and we stop teaching them. Because we haven't given them the tools to survive in the devil's world. They're babes in Christ, as Paul said. They sincerely desire the milk of the Word for now, but they need to have the meat to survive. And it's our job to protect them and teach them to make sure they have the tools necessary when they go out there. That they're not a gullible Galatian who's so soon removed after what they've already heard. Because I can tell you this, there's some smooth preachers out there. You just look at Joel Osteen. My wife will tell you she gets so aggravated at me when I stop on Joel Osteen. Because then I start preaching to him. And she says, Honey, he can't hear you. But here's a man who stands there in his nice $2,000 suit and his nice big stadium that holds 40,000 people and he holds up what he thinks is his Bible. And he says, now hold up your Bible. Mm -hmm. This is your Bible. There are many like it, but this one is mine. And then he puts it down and he never teaches from it. But then you have all those people in that audience, 40,000 plus, of how gullible they are of listening to what he has to say. And they walk out and he hasn't told them a thing of what they needed to do to be Amen. saved. Amen. Sometimes you've got to step on toes and aim at hearts to convict souls so they're not gullible over listening to the falsehood and the, the not so uh, good things out there that some of these so-called gospel preachers are preaching. You see, Paul said, I can't believe that you're so soon removed. Paul was amazed at their gullibility. He could not believe at how soon they went back to something else. But brethren, when we have a new brother or sister in Christ, we need to surround them and protect them because we don't want to lose them. How often do we see somebody come into the church and two or three months later we say, I wonder what ever happened to that person. Where did they go? Shame on us for not knowing Shame on us for not checking. And I'll be the first to point the finger at me because when I preach, I preach from behind me forward. Because sometimes I've fallen short of that too. That's right. So we have a responsibility to look out for them, those young brothers and sisters in Christ. They might be older in age, but they're younger in spirit when it comes to knowing the truth of the gospel. Paul said, I cannot believe how soon you are moved. So ask yourselves, are you going to follow a lie when you hear some of those so-called smooth preachers out there? Are you going to be fooled by a lie? But rather, are you going to be one who fights against a lie? To say, that's not what the Bible teaches. Let me show you what the Bible teaches. You know, I always like it when we have those denominations that come door knocking on my door. The Jehovah's Witnesses mark me. They don't come by my house anymore. But when we moved to a new house and I opened the door, the little lady remembered me. And her eyes got big. She said, didn't you used to live over there? I said, yes, ma'am, I did. Well, she said, I just want to hand you this track. I said, well, can I ask you some questions then? You see, sometimes we have to fight for the lie. That's right. Paul was willing to fight for the lie. Remember what Paul said before those in, in Acts 23? He said, I've lived in all good conscience until this day, brethren. I thought everything I did before was right, but it was wrong. So let me tell you exactly now what you are doing wrong. You remember Peter, that not so politically correct gospel preacher on the day of Pentecost, that said, men and brethren, let me tell you what you did to my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You put Him on a cross and nailed Him there and killed Him. You're the ones who did it. You crucified the Lord and Savior. Now let me tell you what you can do to fix it. Ladies and gentlemen, that's gospel preaching. Amen. Remember it said that it pricked their hearts. That's what the Word does. It's not the messenger, it's God's Word that pricks the heart, that convinces individuals to be saved. Amen. And I'm grateful for the saving power of God's, God's message. So did God get a faithful Philippian? Did He get a gullible Galatian? Or did He get an elusive Ephesian? Look at Revelations 2 and verse 4. Notice what John writes here for us. He said, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Regardless of the good that was said about them, the tale was told by Jesus Christ Himself. Thou hast left your first love. Let me ask you, what's your first love? 
I hope your answer is Jesus Christ. I hope it's the Lord's church and everything else comes second, as it should. They had left their first love. And the prescription in Revelation 2.5 was absolutely clear of what they needed to do. He said you need to remember, you need to repent, you need to redo, and then you need, or else you need to be removed. That's the choice. I don't know if you have a church directory here at Highway 69. We have a church directory at Fayette, and we're blessed that the church secretary keeps that up, and when we have new members, she gives us those. But sometimes we have to go through those, and we have to re- remove pictures for those maybe that have passed away. But I remember when I, when I first got to Fayette that I, I got my church directory, and I sat down with Miss Linda, and I said, okay, I want you to tell me all the people that are in this book that no longer attend here. So we went through and I pulled out all the pages. And I pulled out every single one that no longer attended there. And after I got done, there was about 25 individuals. And I said, Miss Linda, what happened to these folks? She said, they just disappeared. They just stopped coming. I said, no, they left their first love. So we slowly began to get in contact with these people, Kayla and myself. When we see them, we invite them, we encourage them, we want them to be with us. But it's interesting to know that God also has a church directory. And there are some people He's going to have to remove from it. There were those individuals who were so soon removed from that first love, from that which they were already taught, because they lost their love for Christ. I heard Brother Keith Moser say one time, one of our instructors at Memphis, he said, when I first started preaching, he said, I would go around to everybody's house that had fallen away, and I would go see them. He said, but you know what? I made them sin. Thinking, how in the world did he make them sin? He said, well, when the preacher shows up, people start telling lies when they haven't been to church. He said, so I was making these individuals sin. That's right. He said, but I realized later I needed to teach them about their first love again. That's right. He said, so I asked them if they would study the Bible with me. He said, I wasn't there to off to get any excuses. He said, I'm not here. You don't have to tell me why you're not at church. I just want to know if you'll sit down and study the Bible with me. He said, I needed to point them back to Christ because they lost their way. They lost their first love for Jesus Christ. That's what we have to do. It's great we can go visit them and they're just going to sit there and make up excuses and tell you why they can't be at church or how sick they've been for the last year even though they're the healthiest in Alabama football games. But we need to teach them about their first love. You see, we need to teach them what it means to be a faithful Philippian or or, or not an elusive Ephesian, one who's trying to miss church service, so to speak. You see, have you turned your heart from God? Have you left your first love? Are you here out of guilt because somebody invited you? You see, some people do that too. Either that or they're just sick and tired of their spouse bugging them all the time, right? Telling them where they need to be. You see, when I first got out of the Marine Corps, and and I was raised in the Lord's church, and I had a good Christian home, and I had a, a grandfather who was a stern gospel preacher, but you see, I got out of the Marine Corps, and I thought I still knew everything. But I had a faithful Christian wife, and I would say, honey, we really don't need to go to church today, do we? She'd yank me up by the ear, little five foot one self, and said, Boy, you need some Jesus. <laughs> she never, ever let me say no. She never backed down one time with whatever excuse I offered. So, you know what she started doing? She started praying to God that I'd get more active in church. She learned about what she prayed for, didn't she? <laughs> you get exactly what you pray for and more sometimes. But I'm thankful that she didn't allow me to be an elusive Ephesian. That's right that she didn't allow me to make excuses because there weren't any excuses that were good enough. You see, when we leave our first love, we leave everything behind. And most of all, we leave behind our Savior. Remember we talked about the prodigal son last night? When he came to himself, there's nothing better than to see a person come to themselves and come forward and say, I need to come back to God. They don't want to be elusive anymore. So what did God get when He got you? Did He get an elusive Ephesian? Or did he get a lukewarm layout of sin? Look at Revelation 3.16. He says, So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth, Jesus said. Jesus said, I don't want anything to do with you. 
That is, make up your mind who you're going to serve. Amen. Remember what Joshua said in Joshua 24, 15? Choose you this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You have a choice that you have to make. You can't straddle the fence between righteousness and the world. You've got to choose and you can't stand on the fence thinking you can pick sides. Jesus Christ Himself said in Matthew 6, 24, you can't serve two masters. And so many people try and live for the devil during the week and live with God on the weekend and you can't do it. That's right. You've got to make a choice and you've got to do it 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Amen. Being in the Marine Corps, that's one thing I'm proud of. And I'm proud to have had the privilege to have served in the military. And whenever I go somewhere to this day, and my wife, that she's a military Marine brat herself because her dad was in the Marine Corps, we can go somewhere and even my wife can point out and say, that's a Marine right there, even when he's not in uniform. Or he used to be a Marine. You see, Marines pride themselves on the way they carry themselves and they beat that into your head in boot camp. Because they used to tell us you're a Marine 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Once a Marine, always a Marine. But here's the thing I'm more proud of, the title of Christian. But shouldn't it be said the same thing about us that somebody can point to us and say, there's a child of God. Amen. That's a Christian right there. Amen. That's who I want to be like. That's who you can spot out in a crowd. He's not lukewarm in His service. He's faithful when you need Him like the Philippians. He's not elusive like the, Phil- the Ephesians. He's balanced in His Bible study like the Bereans. He's not contentious like those awful Corinthians. And He's not lukewarm like the Laodiceans. He's faithful in His service. He's there when you need Him, when you can call on Him. We've got brethren and sisters in Christ in the congregation of faith that I can know beyond a shadow of a doubt, if I pick up the phone, they will do whatever I ask them to do. And better yet, I like the ones who come to me and say, brother, I need something to do. You see, those are the ones who have a love for God because they know it's not about them and they don't want to be lukewarm in their service. Because look at what God says. He wanted to spew them out of His mouth because He had no use for them. No use for them. And we've got too many congregations of the Lord's church today that are lukewarm in their approach. Amen. They don't do what they need to do. They think they could come in and punch the pew card on Sunday and everything's going to be okay. Mm-mm. There were congregations like that in the Bible in the book of Revelation. And Jesus said, I don't want to have anything to do with them. That's what he said. And He's going to tell us the same thing if we don't get busy. You see, their traits are well known by Bible students. They were rich physically, but unfortunately they were poor spiritually. Do I really care and am I really content with who I am for God? So again, ask yourself the question, what did God get when He got me? Did He get the qualities of a faithful, righteous, holy individual who's ready to serve God faithfully? Faithfully? who's ready to be happy about his Christianity, to share it with individuals, who's ready to study their Bible. Tim Wilkes, who teaches the Fishers of Men class, and Caleb had told me this, and I had forgotten, he mentioned it in our class. Usually the the first night he's going through and he's he's telling everyone about the course and what you've got to do for this course. And he said, all right, this course is 11 weeks long. It's two and a half hours, one night a week. He said, but I require you outside of class to study your Bible And the homework that I give you at least one hour a night, every night, for the entire length of this course. One elder spoke up and said, Do you mean to tell me i got to study my Bible every night? And that's the ones that are leading our congregation. Every night. Do you think you could tell if the preacher got in the pulpit and he wasn't prepared to then study his Bible? Yes, you could. And you wouldn't stand for it, would you? You'd be going to the men of the congregation and the elders wanting to know why this man wasn't studying his Bible like he ought to. But do we look in the mirror and say the same thing about ourselves? Am I studying the Bible like I ought to? Am I lukewarm in my service? Am I contentious in my divisiveness? Because the preacher stepped on my toes and I don't like it very much, I'm going to tell the men of the congregation or the elders that he shouldn't say that or do that? What did God get when He got you? I hope you got a person who loved Jesus, who appreciated the fact of what He did on the cross of Calvary, who's ready to serve Him and not Himself, who's ready to be faithful, balanced, and loving in their service to Jesus Christ. Amen. And if that's you tonight, amen, and I praise you for that. Amen. And I pray that you'll keep up that good work. But if 
Maybe perhaps you were one of the other ones. Maybe you're elusive in your church service and in your visiting and perhaps even coming to church like you ought to. Maybe you've been lukewarm in everything else that you're doing. But maybe tonight something sparked a fire in you. Sometimes we all need that fire. We need that swift kick in the pants to get us going again. And God's Word does it better than anything else. Remember what Jeremiah said? It's fire was shut up in my bones. I could not but preach God's Word, he said. That's what he said. And I hope it's shut up in your bones tonight and I hope that fire is ignited again and that you're ready to do what you need to do tonight. And if that's the case and you're a child of God and you've been lukewarm or elusive and you haven't been balanced and you've been contentious, I hope you'll fix it tonight. We want to pray with you. We'll pray for you. God will forgive you. We'll love you and embrace you. But guess what? You get to leave here faithful and rejoicing like the Philippians. And you get to be one of those balanced Bereans because you'll be ready to study that Word of God again. Yes. And if you're here tonight and you're not a child of God, and maybe it is that you've been elusive in your approach because you're not sure about something. And if there's anything we've said tonight or anything we've done that you have a question about, please ask us. Ask Travis. Ask some of the men in the congregation. We'll be happy to answer it with you, but only with what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. But the Bible does tell you what you need to do to be saved. I'm not going to stand up here looking all pretty because I'm not. And I'm not going to hold up the Bible and say this is what it says when it doesn't. I'm going to tell you exactly what Jesus said that we need to do. And tonight He said you've got to be ready to repent of your sins. That you've got to be willing to say I'm no longer going to live that way. That that godly sorrow has produced repentance tonight. And that you're ready to cast away the cares of the world in the way that you used to live and be who you need to be. Jesus said, unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Luke 13, 3 and 5. But Jesus said, you've got to be ready to confess me before an audience and before man. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 32, Whosoever shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I deny before my Father which is in heaven. You see, if you're not a child of God, Jesus Christ is going to say, Depart from me, for I never knew you. Amen. You don't want that to be the case. But finally, you need to be baptized for the remission of your sins to have them washed away in that watery grave of baptism. Acts 2.38 Tonight, the choice is yours. What did God get when He got you? As together we stand and as we sing. All things are ready. Come to the feast.